Let's talk with the doc. I'm excited as always to join you and to have you joining me. And as always, the Lord has been good and I have been blessed to uh, have uh, wonderful guests. And I don't think it will be any less tonight than it has always been. I'm looking forward to this conversation I'm going to be having with Jennifer Barnaby coming with us live from the Bahamas, Grand Bahamas. I'm sure she has a story that you think you know, and even her friends who may be watching who think they really know her story. I'm, I'm not surprised and I will not be surprised because I've never been surprised that people think they really know somebody and only to find out that there is so much about the person that they really do not know. So when I come back, my friends, I'm going to be talking to Jennifer Barnaby. I encourage you as you join to hit your share button, tell your friends about it, whether it's on Facebook or YouTube, and let them also join the conversation. I come right back and we will continue to talk with Jennifer Barnaby. <laughs> ORB Ministry presents Let's Talk with the Doc. with our borders podcast. A thought for you. Ask pastor. And a whole lot more. You never know what's next or who will join the conversation. All right. Okay. So here we go. Here we go. I have with me tonight um, Jennifer Barnaby. I'm excited to have her. And she's coming to us live from the Bahamas, the Grand Bahamas. And she has a unique and interesting ministry that we will explore as we go through the night. And something you'll find out that I will find out while you're finding out. And so we, I want to thank you for joining me, um, um, Sister Barnaby, Jennifer Barnaby. Thank you for joining me on Let's Talk With The Doc. Good to have you. Thank you so much, Dr. Beckford. It is a pleasure, my esteemed pleasure and honor to be your guest this evening. All right. So thank you for joining me and thank you for being my guest. And I want to I want to um, say thank you to Sister Darlene who has made this possible. She is just a, an exceptional lady. She's a genius, and I want to publicly say thanks to her for her contribution. All right. So I like to I like to begin from the beginning. You know, I like to I like to I like to know get to know people, get to know their beginnings, their early beginnings. What and so learning their early beginnings, then we can get to transition into what inspires them, what motivates them, uh, uh, you know, what their dreams and aspirations were and how they feel about where they are now and where they are going. Uh, so before we get to that, we need, we, we, and now we like to find out what has it been about your early beginning where you were born, you know, parents, uh, 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 family dynamics, siblings, etc. Early schooling, the challenges in the early days before you were Mrs. Barnaby or even Miss whatever that was prior to that. What it was be when it was just Jennifer running around? Okay, thank you for the opportunity again, Dr. Beckford. And um, I was born um, in the quaint settlement of Brayton St. Catherine, Jamaica. Okay, and, Brayton. Um, Brayton, right. Um, actually, old Brayton, the original Brayton, because then after many years, then that whole community evolved. And mm -hmm. um, 
we have now Port Moore, Greater Port Moore, and all of that stuff. But I came from what they called back then Backland. 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 Okay. And um, was born to Eulalie Edwards. She was brown. And um, my dad, Isaiah Edwards. Mm -hmm. I'm the first for my, 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 both my parents, but the second for my father. I have an older brother who is um, 10 years older than I am. And mm -hmm. also I'm the eldest girl. So in total, my father has six children. Mm -hmm. And I'm the second for him. And the first for my mom, my mom gave birth to four children. Uh, my siblings after me are a pair of twins. I lost my brother, who is one of the twins. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Yes, he, he passed away at a young age, tender age of 23, um, about a year and a half after I would have got married and migrated to the Bahamas. So um, that was, you know, that's a little bit about my family. Very humble family. My parents um, didn't have much. They worked in the cane fields, um, yeah, and, and, and that's what I, I grew up with. I grew up in a sugarcane kind of community back then. Well, and that was that sugarcane was in where was that in in you know? Because they have a lot of cane in the Bagua. Bernard here. Lodge, actually Bernard Lodge. Bernard Lodge, okay. And okay. Reed Spain, okay. that old Bernard Lodge, Reed Spain, um, sugar sugar uh, cane. Uh, farm or okay. estate. I know about so parents. Right. Yes, both my parents worked in that. Okay. I, I went to school. I went to the Brayton knowledge. How many? School. How many siblings you have? So I have five siblings. Okay. Right. Okay. And one is deceased. I'm sorry. My brother that. after me, who is twin to my sister. Um. Yes. So mm -hmm. I have. Three others, three three sisters, and one brother. Living. Where did you fall in the group? So I'm number two of my father's children, and number one for my mother. Okay. And I'm the eldest girl. Okay. All right. Yes. All right. My father had a son previous before okay. he got with my mother, who's All ten right. years my senior. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. So then I grew up as the oldest child in my. Okay. Family. Like all right all right all right. all right all right so you grew up with responsibilities oh definitely a lot of responsibility in fact i i was like my mother's best friend growing up and looking back now i realized there were so many things that she laid on me as a child you know um that uh, looking back now um a child children really shouldn't be exposed to some of those things okay the tri trials and tribulations she went through with my father and you know as the oldest child she would she wouldn't have anybody to talk to so she would pour that out on me even as a child mm -hmm. so i just about knew all that she was going through my father he was not always faithful and so you know all of that stuff but um yes we we, we grew up my father he, he after a while traveled back and forth to the united states on the farm work program Mm -hmm. But um, okay, okay. So yes. he was a farm worker. Yes, he was a farm worker. Yes, and um, he we would look forward to those times. They would go away for six months, and they would return after the six months. And oh my God, during that period of time, when the the, the men in the community were returning, you'd hear every morning or every day, "Oh, such and such has come back," and. They, 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 it wasn't the days of cell phones, so you didn't know when they were coming. They just right. pop up. Yeah, you know, yeah. Yep. Sometimes in the early hours of the morning, they just three hours of the morning. I still have <laughs> memories of that. I'm <laughs> dragging in the trunk, and as a child, I was yeah, very yeah. In the trunk. Trunk. Don't we know that trunk thing? You know, that's right. That's right. So yeah. I grew up with that. You know, I and those. Ironically, the, the days when my father traveled on farm work, though I missed him, mm -hmm. were the better days for me because of two things. My father was an alcoholic. Oh. A, a, a severe alcoholic. I'm I mean, so sorry to hear that. He would be drunk from 
Thursday evening straight back to Monday morning. Oh, no. And so not having to see him drunk during those periods when he would be gone on farm work was a relief for me because, you know, it's a small community and you're going to the shop and someone is telling you, oh, see your father is drunk, you know, and that sort of thing. And so that was great time for me when he would travel, when he would go away. <laughs> And then, of course, the monies that would come because every two weeks, you know, he would send, he was faithful in sending home money. And um, I would be the one, the oldest girl, the oldest child in the home to go to the post office and collect the envelope and oh, what joy. I, I trust me. <laughs> I, I, I've never been the one to go to collect it, but, I, but I've been around my family. Mm -hmm. You know, my uncles have gone away, and I know mm -hmm. the joy it brings when those, when the, the check come in from, from oh farm work. So I'm I very well aware of that. So all right, let's go with the conversation. Thank you. Yes, that was exciting, you know. And uh, so that, that's a fun memory of, of my, my childhood, you know, when you would return and you'd return the goodies from foreign you know, it was exciting. Yeah. yeah. Yes. yeah. I'm, I'm with you on that. My friends, I'm talking to, I'm just beginning to talk to Jennifer Barnaby and we're just hearing the beginning of her story. If you're joining me on Facebook or on YouTube, I encourage you that if everyone just hit your share button, if everyone who is, who is watching and listening just hit your share button, just imagine how many of your friends, her friends and my friends will hear this conversation. We haven't gotten into the nitty gritty of, of her accomplishments and her ministry. We're just getting, we're just probing her beginning days. All right, so I, I am I'm so aware of the farm work and the trunk when it comes and everybody oh, yeah. sits in the living room and when they sort of pull out what's in the trunk and everybody see what come for me and what come for me, et cetera, et cetera. So that, that, that's exciting. So what about the, the school days now? You begin yes. to go to school. Yes, so Bishop, I went to the Brayton All Age School, right there in the community. Used to walk to school, walk back and forth to school, um, walk home for lunch, you know, and lunch wasn't much then because mm -hmm. we, we really were poor. Right, you know, right, when right. We talk about abject poverty, we were poor. And so, you know, you walk home and you get a little piece of bulla and a little <laughs> lemonade <laughs> and, you, you know, your bread and butter. I and, hear you, I hear you. That's yes. Jamaican language we're talking there. Uh huh. And you eat up quickly, or if if because my parents were, my mother worked, and so she wouldn't be home at that time when we had lunch. So she sometimes she'd cook and leave something, and we would, you know, we didn't have microwaves to oh. warm up lunch and all of that. So we made things work. And right. um, but I, from a very tender age, Bishop, I realized that in order for me to get out of that poverty lifestyle mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in order for me to experience upward mobility i have to take in my education mm -hmm. and so i i was very keen in paying attention in class um though i was scared of the teachers i scared of beatings and i had one such teacher in grade five. Oh my god she would beat for everything you don't get anything wrong so at that stage in my life it was time for common entrance Mm -hmm. exam because that's how someone as poor as i was could that's, make you, that's how you progress that's how you progress and that's how you progress you pass your common entrance and you go to a high school right and so i was scared in the fifth grade to do the extra lessons be that were required because she would beat the daylights out of you mm. and then too my mother was struggling you know to find the extra fees and so on when I got to the sixth grade, I decided, you know what, you can't duck this anymore. This is your final chance to get a ticket out of poverty. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I enrolled in the, the, the extra lessons. I told my mom about it and um, she sacrificed, as she would call it, sucking salt through wooden spoon. Oh my goodness. All of the Jamaican language we're hearing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, to make sure that I got the extra and Bishop I paid attention I stayed focused did the common entrance exam waited uh, for the results to come out I made God a promise the night before I took the exams I said God if you would allow me to pass these exams I will serve you for the rest of my life because that's how serious I was about getting out of the kind of 
depraved lifestyle that I experienced and I didn't like. I want, I want, I want, I want to, I want to piggyback a little bit on on that thought because at that age, yes, sir. at that young age, you were so aware, so conscious of your own status and limitation and lack of, so that you were you purposed in your mind at that time yes, that sir. this that this is your way out. Yes, you de you determined that if I'm gonna get out of here with you know and achieve become an achiever, then I must pass my my common entrance to step into something brighter. You know, to, that's that's my my gateway into high school and my gateway into the real world. So at that tender age, you were carrying that burden for success. Yes, sir. How much pressure did that put on you? I don't know if it was so much pressure more than it was a drive in me drive, okay a, a drive in me to to succeed and to become something greater than what they were saying in my community that you know i i saw myself more than just the drunkard's child i saw mm -hmm. myself more than the deaf lady's child because my mother um she's hearing impaired she okay okay had fever, um um in the late 30s i think it is early 40s um, when years old and, and deaf and so we were looked down on we were we were scorned by some people uh that those are the deaf ladies children and and the drunkard you know no rainy day that sort yeah. of thing they would say yeah. and i uh, for some strange reason i believe god had his hand on me from i was uh, just a child because i knew that this was not the life that god had for me God had a bright future for me. And so I was invested in that. I was focused. My parents couldn't help me with my homework and my school. No, they couldn't help me, but I stayed focused, did what I could and pushed and made God a promise and God honored his end of the bargain. Wow, so so that, that even got a little bit more interesting because your mother had had her misfortune Yes. In a in a young age, and mm -hmm. and and puts her in 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 limitation, limits her own ability, yes. uh, because you know not like in a, in America where if you're born in you know hearing impaired, you can still progress in life because there's access to uh, to the deaf school or the dumb school as they call it, and you could you could actually still climb the ladder of success. Yes. Back then, way back then, in certain locations, that was not an option for some people. It's just a matter of fight on and try to survive. So you. You're carrying you're carrying two heavy baggages, emotional, psychological. As you go through as a young person trying to succeed, my father is a drunkard, my mother is deaf, and so I'm carrying the scars of my in my community of carrying those two on my shoulders. Yes. And and in spite of that, you decided I am going to pursue something bigger so I can get out and look back. Yes. Yes. And so, thanks be to God, I passed my common entrance and went to Holy Childhood High School. Holy Childhood, all right. Holy okay. Childhood. So you were the girl in white. Yes. Well, <laughs> no, that's immaculate. I was a girl in blue. You're right. girl in blue. You're girl in blue. You're right. Immaculate is in white. Yes, you're right. Yes, Go ahead. yes, yes. That was a great achievement for me. I could still remember my graduation day as my mother sat and wept, mm. tears streaming down her face because she was watching her first child graduate from high school Amen. when she didn't get past first third grade or something like that mm -hmm. class three mm -hmm. i think they call it back then and yeah. to, to watch me graduate from high school that was an accomplishment that was an achievement but it didn't stop there Wow. I, I knew that my parents didn't have the money to send me to uh, to college, and my ambition was to become a professional. Mm -hmm. I, mm -hmm. At first, I, I aspired to be a, an accountant because I thought that's where the money was. Yeah. But then I realized that the only way for me to get a, a tertiary education was through free education, and teaching was that door teaching was that avenue mm. where we were provided with that free tertiary education and so okay. I, applied, okay. I applied to teachers college and was accepted into michael teachers college now michael university 
and and pursued uh, my teacher education good for you yes good for and, you um, again that was a first in our family in fact i will i'm the first uh, person in my entire family on both sides to be a college graduate mm. i was wow. the first first generation and then then one of the questions one of the questions we ask in the in in the chaplain field is how does that make you feel you know how that make you feel after you have purposed in your heart not just with your imagination but you put the action into work and and you and you're gaining the success and from one success it leads to another and and you keep on climbing how that make you feel when you when you get when you apply to the teachers college and you get accepted they said yes that's gonna be my way out listen bishop that was the greatest greatest feeling my mother was just dumbstruck with with it just she was shocked i am i could only imagine and in fact she looked at me and she said where am i going to find the money to send you to school and i told her don't worry about it because i knew that teacher education was free mm -hmm. and um uh the, the other fees and so on that we had to pay i had worked after high school for a year and a half at the free zone i don't know if you know about that bishop i know i know about free zone i i, I know that that the name free zone rings a bell i remember that name too i remember Marcus Carvey drive yeah. Oh, yeah drive with the koreans yep and so i zone after high school now back is you graduate from high school and you have your cxc's and you're you're working in the free zone you are ashamed to your community i remember yeah. one morning i was going to work and as i was walking to the bus stop there was a lady and her child behind me walking and i could hear the lady talking bad about me with her mm. child mm -hmm. They gone to good high school and working in free zone, but wow. that did not deter me because I had a focus, and my focus was to earn enough money, save enough, so that I was able to put myself in college. Little, so, little, little did she know, right? Little, little did she did know. She know. Little did she know. Um, I was so embarrassed to be working at the free zone. To be honest with you, that I would allow the bus to pass the free zone. Wow. and go to zinc factory i, remember, I know those places <laughs> and bishop i'm telling you and had to walk walk it back walk it back wow. and i had to be at work for seven o'clock so that was early morning but the embarrassment um that anybody should see me coming off at the free zone they know exactly where you're going if i come out at the zinc factory i may be going uh, towards three miles or somewhere else mm -hmm. that's how embarrassing it was for me mm -hmm. as a 17 year old but i was determined i was determined i had my heart set on a better life so that's so I'll, 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 although although your pride was scarred there to a certain extent you were looking and saying this is this is not it this is only another stepping stone this is not my destiny this is only my journey and my right. destiny is what I'm looking, what I'm pursuing. So, uh, right. you know, um, you, don't judge me by my by my journey because you don't know what my destiny is. All right. Okay. So now you have gone into that, and you you've gone to teachers college in spite of in spite of the the year and a half of the free zone, the 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 the, 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 the down what do I call it now the, the low the low life cal calculation in right. the minds of the others like the Pharisees mm -hmm. said you know I'm not I'm not like this publican you know I'm not like this publican you know I, I'm I'm of a higher level mm -hmm. but but little did they know you're just climbing your ladder so you get into Cheetah's college and and what happened after that and after uh, well I started working after um I finished teachers college I in fact I went back to my school, my, my, my district school, the school that I went to as a child, I taught there. And um, during the course of that year teaching there, um, well, my now husband came into my life. Okay, so, so, so things begin to happen now. You, I'm in teacher's college, and, now, and th now this gentleman see this beautiful teacher, or this teacher is not seeing somebody coming from free zone, 
he's seeing, he's seeing, <laughs> he's seeing somebody now who is a teacher. So now you become an attraction to him. So yeah, uh, tell me about that story. Well, <laughs> actually, my husband and I met when I perhaps was in high school okay. at his aunt's house. Um, his aunt was my Sunday school teacher and had taken me under her wings as a mother. So she's one of my church mothers, one of those who mentored me through my teens in my church. So now, and, you, were, uh, you, now you were a Christian. At what, at what time did you become a Christian? So at the age of seven, I received Jesus in my heart under the ministry of Donald, Pastor Donald Gordon. At the and age of seven. Seven. And they told me I was too young to be baptized. I didn't know mm. what I was doing. But Bishop, mm. I still remember. Mm -hmm. And when I was 12 years old, they still refusing to baptize me. I'm still a child. And there was a baptism being held at the Spanish Town New Testament Church of God which was our district church at the time. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, Bishop, uh, uh, Bishop Elder uh, Johnson, um, he was a lieutenant, sorry. He was a pastor at the time. And um, he was also pastoring my church because our pastor had migrated. Mm -hmm. And they had some young converts who were going to be baptized and I asked my mother can I go with them because I had made God a promise remember and I had yes, passed my yes, exam did, and yes, I'm now in high school and I have to carry out that promise I with them and I got baptized you know and thank God it was Bishop Joseph Lawrence not an lieutenant Bishop Joseph Lawrence who baptized me mm -hmm. and at age 12 and I started my journey with the Lord then God bless your heart. God bless your heart. Um, God bless your heart. And 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 I'm and I'm thankful that he really did save your tender heart. And yeah. you and you were so serious about it that you were communicating with God. That was a deal between you and God in the mm -hmm. innocence of your youth. That God, I see you as my way out. And I promise you that if you just help me to pull myself through, we're tied together for the rest of my life. That was your commitment. And you and you carried it out. God bless you. And God bless you. God bless you for a young person to to have been that determined and um and to have uh, pulled your way through. And now you're Christian girl, baptized, and all the wonderful things that mean gone to Jesus College, grow up to being a young lady, and now you know people begin to have their eyes on you. Well, and so uh, my my now husband, uh, we met when I, while I was in high school, and then um, after I went off to college, um, I was not in that close contact with my church mother, who was his aunt. And um, our meeting at his aunt was brief. I, I saw him as an older cousin. He's a, a year and a little bit older than I am. Mm -hmm. um, I saw him as an older cousin because uh, my church mother at the time who is, who was, is his aunt. She, she had a daughter my age. And so he would be he's very responsible. He would be cooking lunch for us and that sort of thing. So never paid any attention to him in that way. And um, after I started teaching, his aunt and I, we had to go to a church conference together and she met me. She said, oh, by the way, I've been trying to reach you. Um, do you remember my nephew, Dave? He, do you know that he was born in the Bahamas and he returned to the Bahamas? And um, uh, my daughter went up to spend some time with him and he was inquiring of you. He would oh. like your address. Okay. Like, no, <laughs> not interested. I had just come out of a relationship where my heart was splintered, not just broken, splintered. I'm so sorry to hear that. Yes. Well, thank God, because out of that, out of the bitter came sweet. Yeah, 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 um, yeah, yeah. And I was like, mm, not too interested. She was like, yeah, okay, um, I mean, he just needs your address. I was like, okay, send it to him. Got a long story short. He got in touch with me and uh said i'm coming to jamaica i have a question to ask you i was like what ask me now no i'll wait until i get there bishop this was a just a a, a, a crazy crazy thing it just happened so quickly it, it was just like lightning he came so did, to you, did you did you think that would have been the question he, he wanted to ask you I, after he was hesitant i thought mm, perhaps he's asking me to be his girlfriend Oh, okay. So I'm like, mm, let's see how that one goes because 
I first of all, I don't trust. I didn't trust church men anymore because I had had my heart broken twice mm, by so church men, Holy Ghost speaking in tongues, carrying yeah, the Bible. Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh and yeah. So oh, I yeah. was like, mm, don't think so. My plan right now is to just stay focused, build, you know, get build my life, and you know that sort of thing. So when he came, the very first day I met him at his aunt's house, and he wasted no time. Mm to ask me to be his wife. I was like, you're crazy. Uh, are there no women in Freeport? And he was like, you don't know, but I've been, ad I had been admiring you. I met you at my aunt's house. I had no clue, no clue. Wow. So he asked me that day to marry him. I was like, seriously, I have to pray about this. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is a serious thing. Yeah. I have to pray. And he was, I'm, uh, I'm like, did you pray about it? <laughs> yes, I did. I said, okay, well, I will have to ask my daddy yeah. because I'm not playing around with my art anymore. And so, you know, that afternoon we spent uh, quite a couple of hours at his aunt's house just talking and sharing. And Bishop, the most amazing thing happened that afternoon, mm -hmm. that evening. Mm -hmm. She left us to go to church. She said, lock my house up when y'all are finished talking. And we stayed there and we, we shared and we talked and he, he poured his heart out to me about how much he loved God. Mm. And we started singing and worshiping and we had a worship experience at his aunt's dinner table. That was something that I had never experienced with anyone. That was a spiritual connection. I, I mean, it was different. It was new. It was strange. And I was like, wow, who are you? So the starting point is a Holy Ghost prayer meeting. I'm telling you. <laughs> I'm telling you. I was like, wow, this is different. That's a real spiritual connection. That's interesting. That's interesting. And so that's, that, that's what so our cool. start. That was our so start. That, so that, see, that sealed it for you because that was kind of uniquely different than that 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 lured you in and tied you in mm -hmm. yes sir but i i told him i said listen we've got to continue praying because i must know that this is god's perfect will for me and i had i had spiritual parents i had spiritual fathers and mothers who were watching over my soul and i told him i said unless they are in agreement nothing mm. is happening Okay. And I remember going to my spiritual father's house all the way from Portmore to St. Mary, he and I, to find him, to get his blessing. And when we got there, he was in Kingston. Mm -hmm. And the disappointment, but the, that was a Saturday, the Sunday morning, my spiritual daddy, Bishop A.G. Sims, called me early Sunday morning. And he said, I heard you were here and you brought a man. Mm. And after... After wow. ragging me like a good father, who is he? Where he come from? Ah, uh, so now he know you're a teacher. He's looking for a teacher wife, and mm -hmm. after okay. ragging me, right. <laughs> <laughs> he then said, "Daughter, as soon as I got home and they told me you were here, I prayed, and the Holy Spirit has given me the witness that that is God's plan for your life." Wow! Wow! It was over. That was it. When daddy says that's it, that's it. Amen. That was it. Six months later, we were married. Six months later. Good for then you. We returned to the Bahamas. So we spent a total of three weeks in person before getting married. So he's gone back to the Bahamas. And um, and what happened to Jennifer after uh, after the daddy sealed it off that this, I'm, I'm convinced this is God's will. You gone back to, he's gone back to the Bahamas and now we are where where are we now? Where are you left? Where are you left now? Now I, I'm left, you know, just 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 butterflies fluttering all over my heart and can't wait for June to show up. And I, I kept myself busy because uh, I was very busy in the church. I was youth director at the time. Uh, I, I was very, very active. I was on the national camp planning committee. With, with, with Bishop Donald Roberts. I, I you know, I, I was busy. I, I was doing all sorts of things. And really, I did not want to get married in June because I wanted to do camp and vacation, Bible school and convention before having to get married and leave. But 
he would not have it. He said six months, the max, he could wait. He couldn't wait any longer to return. And so um, I, I continued my teaching and making preparations for the wedding and, you know, uh, just in expectation that he would return and honor his word to marry me. It was an exciting time, the longest six months of my life. Uh, I, I can imagine. I can imagine that. Okay, so so now you um, and uh, my friends, I'm talking to Jennifer Barnaby. Of, uh, at least, uh, as many of you know, and we've just kind of probing her beginning stages, the process as she comes to, as she came through her life, and it's an, it's already interesting how how things unfold. And um, sometimes you never know the direction the God is taking you and what your life is going to become down the road. And but as you continue to take the steps one at a time. It's only when you begin to look back that you can really put together what the journey was like. So I'm encouraging you, if you have not yet hit your share button, if you can have 25 people who are watching, just hit your share button, whether on YouTube or Facebook, and, and you know, and invite your friends, because I'm sure you're going to hear something about Jennifer that you have not yet heard. All right? And make sure to, to subscribe to my YouTube channel, follow me on Facebook, because you never know who I'm going to talk to next. All right, so now he's gone back to the Bahamas. The marriage time comes up, and let's say you get married. Finally, the longest six months yeah. of your life yeah. uh, became reality, and now transition begins. Yes, sir. So I, I, I somebody, came got to, somebody got to pick up and move. Yes, yeah, I had to move. Was <laughs> glad to move. Oh, you were glad to move. Okay. Glad right. to leave that environment. Okay. All glad right. To move. Didn't know what I was coming into, but was happy for a change. Because mm -hmm. having um, gone to, to college and lived on campus and experienced a better life than home, you mm -hmm. know, um, and to come back into that environment, and I tried my best to improve my, my immediate uh, surrounding, my home, my parents' home, and so on, but was glad to, to, to move glad to, mm -hmm. to, to ex go and experience a new life and to spread my wings. And so I moved here to the Bahamas right after our honeymoon. I came and um, to be with my husband. He flew out the Friday. We had some uh, difficulties, um, some setbacks. And um, the Monday I was on the next flight out to Freeport to begin my new life as a new wife. A new life as a new wife. Good. So, so you, so you told me that he was he was born in the Bahamas, partially grew up in Jamaica, yes, and then went back to the Bahamas, yes. And you were always Jamaican, and he left the yes. Bahamas, come to Jamaica to find his wife, yes. uh, and and to take her to the Bahamas. And now you are now in the Bahamas, and your life begins anew. Yes. And, what was um, what was that transition like to 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 get into a new place? smaller island for that matter uh you know um but you know new life begins what was that like you for you with the transition i was very very happy with my husband um we were in love he treats treated me like a queen from day one and still does Good for you, so i was happy to be with him mm -hmm. but i was missing home mm. i was missing home because it was just the two of us and he has another he has another cousin um a similar situation was born here grew up in jamaica return he and his wife so we, we didn't have much family here and so it was a bit lonely just coming into a new environment trying to find a church to settle in he was a part of a baptist church and that wasn't working out for me because i am pentecostal, pentecostal. As they, uh, yeah. <laughs> oh yeah oh yeah as pentecostal as they come so here yeah. here am i coming with my broad hat because we were forced to wear hat back home in the testament church of god I and um a young girl 23 years old 23 and a half years old in the baptist church next to my 20 24 and a half years old husband almost 25 years old husband i'm sitting down and and i feel the holy ghost and i'm shouting and speaking mm -hmm. in tongues and everybody turning around i know me. i know exactly oh, what that looks like, that like. <laughs> So first thing my we husband told me, get the center of attention, right? The center of attention. That's right. And at the same first... time, trying not to be, to disrupt things. That's right. That's mm. right. All so right. I had to be quenching and squeezing and, you know, that sort of thing. And 
person, my husband told me, I don't like you in hats, so please lose those hats. I had to send them back home to my mom. Uh-oh, <laughs> uh-oh, uh-oh. So this culture at that time, only the older women were, were hats, and that uh -oh. was really Church of God. Uh -oh. And, um, you know, I, 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 I was having difficulty, man, squeezing the Holy Ghost, man. I, I want, I'm a shouter. I, I want to shout, but I can't shout. So I told him, I have to find a church. I have to find a church. And so, you know, we didn't have a car at the time. Um, he didn't, he, we, I was looking for the New Testament Church of God because that's where I come from. Couldn't find any New Testament Church of God. Mm -hmm. I hadn't started working yet, so I wasn't, I, I wasn't um, exposed to too many people. Um, and so didn't know how to find this church that I was looking for. But I would listen to the radio on Sunday mornings. And one Sunday morning, I heard a preacher preaching and he was preaching like the kind of preaching I'm used to. Oh, yeah. Bishop Rudolph Arthur. And I said, who is that man? I want to go to his church, you know, and um, long story short, I, I end up, um, after I started teaching, um, one of my co-workers introduced me to that church and I, I, I started going to the Church of God of Prophecy. So I didn't find the Testament Church of God. Okay, okay, okay. Some time after, I was traveling and I noticed a familiar sign and I said, that's the church's logo. So you so you run into it. I didn't. I said, that's how come I've never seen this logo? It was a central church of God. And oh. then was when I discovered that here in the Bahamas, like the United States, they're just called the Church of God. Church and of not God. Yeah, church yeah, of God. yeah, yeah. So yeah. I believe I believe God hid the church of God from me for <laughs> some years. I, I, I believe there was something in the Church of God of Prophecy that he wanted me to learn. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and so I stayed in Church of God of Prophecy for 20 years. Wow. For 20 years. I served under Bishop Rudolph Arthur, um, Pastor Lord L. Wilshcom, and, and those. And, um, and there came a time when I felt the Lord saying, it's time to go back home. Mm. Time to go back home. That happens and so, sometimes. And so I returned to the Church of God, where I currently worship. But the Church of God of Prophecy is still in my bones. Well, um, my pastors often laugh at me because sometimes I'll be making announcements and start saying, uh, the Church of God of Pro and then he, he, <laughs> he just bursts out laughing, you spent too many years there. But uh, yes, that, that. So transitioning for me was, I'm, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not sure that, that I. And I'm not sure that I picked up that you were. You were. You were in the Church of God of Prophecy for that long. I. I am not sure I picked up on that. I'm not sure if I saw that. But. But good for you. Yes. Uh, so we. We have. We have a lot of things in common. You know. We have a lot of things in common. I. Um. I. 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 I have so many of my years in the Church of God of Prophecy, and still is there. You know. Uh, so. Uh, we we're connected at some at some point at some place, and even if it's a church of God, we're still uh, organizationally connected. Uh, you right. know, you know, from from our history beginnings, right. there's still the connection that can that can be be um be removed. That that is a lifetime experience. All right, so now you so you've been in the Bahamas, you're teaching, and now there there is there is other ministry um, opportunities or things to explore. Um, so I let me let me let me glance in here. You you serve. Uh, so let me glance at what year you you're currently and currently and I, I know you're gonna you're gonna get me there. Mm -hmm. Currently, your role your role with Caritas is community en engagement and partnership manager, um, and the Grand Bahamas Resilience Center, where you work with community leaders, partners, and other community members to spread awareness around emotional wellness and well being and foster social connectedness uh we may be going to come back to a little of what the church experience because I, I i saw that you know people somebody and mm -hmm. they're telling you know how great a preacher you are and i know you know they can uh, get enough of your preaching something to that effect so we want to come back to the to to this where you are now your current role what is what is caritas Okay, so Caritas, as it's called, Caritas, is, okay. is, is uh, an, an international organization, um, and it's run by the Catholics, 
Okay. Um, and this organization, they, they aid countries in distress. Okay. So in the time of crisis and disaster, mm -hmm. they would go to countries and, and, and provide support and assistance. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, uh, my, my introduction to Caritas happened after the devastating Category 5 Hurricane Dorian. Mm. And so after Dorian came through and ravished Grand Bahama and Abaco, this organization, like so many others, came mm -hmm. in. And the, um, well, in the United States, they are called Catholic Relief Services, CRS. Mm -hmm. And um, the overall body is Caritas Internationales. Mm -hmm. And we have branches in Haiti and um, in, in St. Lucia and different places. Um, the headquarters for the Caribbean is in St. Lucia. Caritas Antilles. And so they came in and they wanted to provide aid and like all the other organizations. And uh, most of these organizations were providing food and water um, to this place. And, and I mean, it was so devastating. Mm -hmm. To say the least, Dorian decimated the islands. And um, they provided food and clothing and, and so on. And um, Caritas provided repairs, we call it shelter and repairs. They, they did the mucking and the gutting and, you know, helping with the repairs of homes. But they realized that this, this island has um, experienced over the past 20 years or more, back-to-back, um, mm -hmm. -back, several hurricanes that have just continued to batter the island and, and recovery was very slow. Mm -hmm. And um, they considered the, the psychological impact that mm -hmm. this mm -hmm. hurricane, on top of all the other hurricanes, mm -hmm. would have cost the people. And so they decided, besides helping to restore homes, they're going to help to restore lives. They're going to provide a longer term um, restoration and support. Mm -hmm. And so they decided to open the Grand Bahama Resilience Center, which is a community center that right. promotes emotional health. Uh, mental health and wellness is our focus. So so this this so this resilience center uh, was was triggered, mm -hmm. inspired by um, uh, the the various impacts that hurricane has uh, has had over the years on the on the communities. Yes. Sir. And so um, it's interesting. I'm, I'm interested to find out: was that a discovery, or was that something that one just kind of perceive that with all of this, there there, there has to be a long-lasting emotional, psychological impact on people, or was that that you people have seen or have a conversation with people of the impact that it has had on them. And now somebody is motivated or inspired to create a center. Well, actually the group CRS, the Catholic Relief Services, they realize that most um, NGOs um, in, in, in the event of, of, of disaster focus on the, the physical uh, implications or, or the physical damage that 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 disaster would would would, would, would create mm -hmm. and so they focus on uh, meeting the, the the physical needs and and not so much the psychological needs okay uh, you know and so they decided we're going to do something different so fast forward or maybe rewind the hurricane happened September 1st, battered our islands for three days. And when it was over, hundreds of people were missing. Oh, I remember that. I Literal remember. homes were washed away with entire families. I remember that. The families I know, home and family washed away. Oh, my good Lord. Everyone was devastated. Wow. It was a total wreck. Um, I was on my porch, sinking slowly in depression because one of my co-workers and very good friend, we had not heard anything from her mm -hmm. from the night after one o'clock 
just before things started getting bad, we came off the phone. And from then, that was it. Never heard from her again. Mm -mm. And I feared that she and her family had passed, had mm -hmm. been washed away. Because mm -hmm. the news coming out of that community is mm -hmm. that there's nothing left. Wow. And so I was sinking in depression on my porch, watching as the helicopters flew past my house and wondering if every helicopter that passed, if that was the dead body, bad the body of my friend and her family. Mm -hmm. And I got a call from Atlanta, Georgia, from a cousin-in-law of mine. She said, because I was trying to reach you for a couple hours, God gave me a message to give you. God said to tell you, do not be dismayed. And he said to pick yourself up, get yourself together, because you're going to help the nation to heal. Oh, really? Okay. Like, wow. Okay. I got off the phone with her. I knew God had spoken especially mm -hmm. that less than an hour after the call i received a phone call your friend has been found she and her family oh. and they are okay wow i said my oh, god i know that you have spoken that part of it has just come true mm. but i don't know how little me how i am going to help the eighth nation to heal well when i had i had I had just, Bishop, listen to this. That was September the 1st. On June the 22nd, 20, the 21st of June in 2019, school closed for me. I walked away and I woke up. Well, I didn't go to sleep that night. I could not sleep. My spirit was troubled, was restless. And early that morning, about 4 a.m., I said out of my mouth, it is finished. My journey of 26 years in this institution is over. I'm done. I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know why. But I felt a push, mm. a literal push to close the door of 26 years in this institution. I was the oldest, the longest serving member of staff at that point in time wow i had come up through the ranks i was head of the department the largest department in the school i was carrying several programs but at that after having a wonderful graduation that i had planned and conducted i walked away and that night the 21st couldn't sleep and the 22nd i got up i woke my husband up and i said my journey is finished that door is closed he was shocked so just i mean you're you're up front you're in leadership you're and and all of a sudden the influence the wooing the tugging at the heart the conviction and everything packaged in one with what you have heard from from a call confirmed in your spirit and now uh september to june that is what nine months later um everything everything comes to to an abrupt end so bishop i didn't get the call as yet that was june oh you didn't get the call as yet that was june and although i had given out applications to other schools i went on interviews that were successful there were people who wanted me i had no desire to go back to the classroom and I got so confused because I realized that my husband it was becoming concerned. We have we at the at that time we had two children in university mm. abroad. And wow. here am I, no job, and I'm not taking the jobs that are coming to me. And I couldn't understand. And I prayed. I said, God, you have to make this clear to me. And I realized he did not want me back in the classroom. I didn't know why. And so fast forward from June, then came September 1st. When okay, I should so, have been returning to school, to some school somewhere, and then the hurricane happened. Okay. And okay. then I got that call. Okay. And God is so 
intentional and strategic that I got that call on the 5th of September. By the 7th of September, I got another call that says they're putting together a group of educators and because by the time no school could happen, educators and counselors and uh, persons in leadership uh, to form a task force that they're going to train to go into the community and provide psychological support. I knew that God was calling me. Right. I knew that this was what God had started to tell me two days prior. And so I, without argument, I said yes. I showed up on the 10th of September to the meeting. And after a rigorous work week of training in psychological recovery and psychosocial support, we were in the streets. We were knocking in every community, knocking door to door, checking in on people, checking in on their mental and emotional state. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so wow. God so, is just so intentional. So I'm getting to how I got to Caritas. Yeah, uh, yeah, I, I hear you, Anna, because I'm I'm just correcting myself because I thought at first that it was September, then June, but now now I'm understanding it is June, June then September. Then September. Okay, so now now okay, all right. So now now we are now we are online. That is that is fascinating, and and uh, again, you know, um, uh, and. Uh, the more I talk to people, the more I realize I can share with them one favorite thought that I have been sharing with my congregation and many of my guests, because, and this is the line that I shared and I, and I see it relevant here with you, is that one of these days, God will show you the mystery of your history, the yeah. mystery of your history, because sitting down there, uh, walking away from, from a job you've been in for so long, and um and and jobs are coming and you're not responding yes to them and uh, and now now here comes the hurricane and uh, your kids are away in in college and and things are unfolding that doesn't even make sense to the human mind yes. and, and and if somebody asked you what what could be going on with you jennifer are you out of your mind how could you be you know and but, but one of these days, God will show you the mystery of your history as you're able to look back and put the pieces together, the things that made no sense to you in the process. Now that you can look at all the pieces and you can put them together, now it makes a whole lot of sense. So, so here you are now, hurricane happens, boom. You were, you were gone before school wasn't happening. And now there is something for you to do with your educational background and the skills that you've had to put into another place where it's now not just educating, but it's ministry. That's it. That's so it. let's go now with Caritas and, and, and resume. So, and you know, with all of that came the opportunity. I, right. I started volunteering with Red Cross after this team restoration and Red Cross continued to provide psychological support to the community. And it was now kind of kind of making a little bit of sense to me where God said, I'm going to help to heal the community. And I, and I saw that coming to fruition. And then came Caritas. I was one day doing um, service with the Red Cross, providing uh, psychosocial support. When I receive a call from Caritas, please submit your resume. Hmm. Wow. When I went online and checked what the requirements were, made no sense to me. <laughs> because they were asking, for, I'm a teacher, I'm an educator. They're asking for people with psychology background. And I was like, should I, should I not? And my daughter, she said, Mommy, submit it. Hmm. I submitted it. And then doing some other psychosocial work with another organization they too asked me to submit uh -oh. my resume uh -oh, uh oh so now i have two resumes for jobs that i was not qualified for <laughs> in man's eyes in fact someone who i had trained with prior to mm -hmm. um i'm um, 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 being contacted by these persons basically told, you look at what they're asking for do you see yourself fitting anywhere there to discourage me. But uh -oh. I thank God for the support of a loving husband and family and a great 
friends who believe in me. And I submitted mm. my resumes and was called to interview, successfully nailed the interview and was on December the 1st, 2019, began my job at Caritas Bahamas. Caritas, with Caritas uh, uh, Antilles mm -hmm. for the Resilience Center as a community engagement officer. Mm -hmm. Now look at how God is intentional and just crazy. A year later, I was promoted to community engagement and partnership manager. Wow. And through that, God has used me to bless touch you. the entire nation. God bless your heart. The programs that we do at the center, through my connections with community leaders, pastors, government leaders, civic organization, God has just catapulted me into this. And now I understand why I did not want to take a teaching job because had I been in teaching, I would never have accepted it. I wouldn't have been exposed to this. The mystery of your history. It makes no sense. One day you'll be able to put the P and look back when you can track it. Right now it's a mystery because we're going it, it you, you can't figure it out. But when you look back and say, this is where I've traveled. And you can put all the pieces together. That is incredible. So now it makes sense. It makes sense that the God who is working internally, who also sees in the future, knows what is coming ahead. And you and those around you have no clue. But, but he's keeping your heart resisting to submit to those offers because he knows that if you submit to those you would lose the that he would you would not be able to fulfill the that what he really wants exactly. so he held you hostage in your mind not wanting to and now when the moment comes just what you think you weren't qualified for right what you think you weren't qualified mm -hmm. for and um when i listen to that i hear i hear i hear um you know saul is saying to to, to david you know yeah you know yeah yeah we, you know you, you can't do this you can't do this it's a dangerous thing that you know we've seen big great men crumble uh before the the philistines you know but mm -hmm. but then the man is saying you know and god when god is with you and when god is leading and when god is directing you know that's great right. things happen beyond your imagination and so that's where that's where this is now so so you are now in a, your the, the caritas thing works and you mm -hmm. now are into a job assignment that in your own mind you're not qualified for and in the mind of those around you you shouldn't even attempt to but here you are now into it accepted and you are excelling yes so uh, for me, this is more than a job. This is a ministry. A ministry. That's because, what I said. Yeah. Go ahead. Because, you know, it's more than just helping to promote mental health and wellness. Mm -hmm. God is, 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 is a God of completion, is a God of wholeness. And he wants us to be sound in our minds, sound in our spirit and sound in our body. And I have the opportunity not only to just speak to people's mental health, but speak, and, and I, I, I am the doorway to people getting help. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I am the doorway. Our mission is to remove the stigma from mental health as much as possible so that persons can access the help that they need. And to help persons to understand that mental health is health too. But in doing that, in, in, in propagating that message, I'm able to also give people hope. I like I like the, hope. I like the idea of um, I like the idea of moving the the stigma from mental health because there has been a stigma um, attached to mental health. And, and and unfortunately it is also attached in the church. Mm -hmm. It is also attached in the church yes. because there are some church people who think that if you are Christian enough, then you should not have mental health 
problems because because some people tend to think that a mental health problem is a spiritual problem and and and, and mental health is not spiritual uh, problem mental health is also physical it's just like uh, any health high blood pressure is just like diabetes is something that affect the physical person so it is it is good for us to to educate ourselves and to help to educate others and to help to educate those who are mentally ill because people do not some people don't seek help for mental health because they want to keep it covered because mm -hmm. because as, as you say have the stigma the that stigma. is attached mm -hmm. to that stigma that's attached to that. Mm -hmm. So so good for you. God bless you. So so now I I noticed that this this ministry and, and I was I, I was kind of scanning through the um uh, the, the the Grand Bahamas Resilience Center uh today just just scanning a little bit and I noticed uh, little segments of programs that that the that 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 the community institution offers mm -hmm. for individuals or individual groups. Tell us about that and tell us about the reach of it because as we were saying that this is not just exclusively locked into the Bahamas, but there is a, an arm of extension to that ministry. Tell us about the ministry, what it covers, accessibility to it, and how it reaches beyond the borders. Yes, yeah, so as I said before, it's a community center. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, it's located right here in Freeport, Grand Bahama, in a centrally located um, area where people can access the center. However, um, we have programs that go beyond just this physical space. Mm -hmm. As you would have known, COVID-19, um, you know, March of 2020, everything went under lockdown. And right. we had just opened the center to the community. In fact, it was about maybe two or three days after opening to the community that the government locked down the entire country. Really? Yes, really. Really? And yes. So, you know, I, and I'm, I'm not trying to stop you. Literally it, had I, I'm not trying to, to stop you or to do really, but, but I have to pause and say, <laughs> really? Mm -hmm really so 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 then what was the devil saying to you then or what was your mind saying to you before you get into the progression of that what was your mind saying to you that really three days into this we're on lockdown bishop i remember the day because we we had our official opening with government officials and port authority people and all of those the thursday the sunday night of that same weekend was when the prime minister announced that the country would be locked down wow we turned up to work the monday morning deciding what to do with the way forward and when i looked around the room everybody looked so sad and gloomy I what does this mean for us does this mean that we're not going to be getting paid because we're being sent home what does this mean and mm -hmm. the Holy Spirit prompted me to pray mm -hmm. for the staff. And I prayed. And we went home. Now, being the community engagement officer, it was my responsibility now to come up with ideas in terms of programming. I'm home. And I'm like, Lord, what do I do? Because Caritas and Catholic receives relief services. They came in with the money, mm -hmm. but they didn't come in with the program. Right. We, the, the, the program rested on us and yeah. had to be formulated by us. Right. And I'm like, God, what do I do? Because the mission has to go on. And the Lord prompted me to start calling seniors. Okay. So that's where our programming started with a calling pick up the telephone and call seniors i got numbers from pastors and and leaders of their seniors in their congregation and in their organization and i just start, made a list and and i just started calling and checking in on seniors because they were the most vulnerable mm -hmm. indeed and out of that my god god is so awesome out of that was birth a radio show on the on the front porch very interesting very that run for a while you know 
and, 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 and so that started. And then I started praying. Let me tell you something. Holy Spirit is real. I started praying, God give me ideas. Because every morning, my, my, my then director would check in with us and ask us, what was your plan for the day? You didn't tell me anything to do. So what are you asking me? What are my plans? I'm locked down in my house. What do you expect me to do? And at that point, I started getting frustrated because I'm saying, God, they do expect us to do something, although we're in lockdown and they're still paying us. And I said, Holy Spirit, you got to show up. You got to talk. And Bishop, my God is awesome. He started just birthing programs out of me, birthing programs. And I would send her the ideas and she would be like, great, go for it, go for it. And so we started a number of programs virtually. Virtually. That's where we started. That, that's what COVID drove us to do, right? We got to get virtual, still stay connected, creativity, yeah. innovation, yeah, use up the source and the resources that are available. Uh, yeah, also, yeah. That's mm -hmm. not turning crisis into opportunity. That's what they right, right. So now you're reaching seniors. You 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 got into radio. It you your the ministry impact others, and it continued for a while. And now uh, the, the 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 lockdown is lifted, and 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 what happened? We're back into the center. We continued some of our programs virtually because some persons were still not comfortable to come to the center, and so we're juggling what they call a hybrid. Some uh, on Zoom and some in the about, center. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we have programs, all our programs are geared towards mental health and wellness. Mm -hmm. So we're not saying to persons, oh, you know, mental health is so and so. But when you have an exercise class in the center and someone is exercising, it's helping their mental health. When mm -hmm. you do a webinar on entrepreneurship, you're giving somebody hope. Mm -hmm. in a time of crisis mm -hmm. where they've lost their job and their business and so on and so you're helping their mental health and so we we we, we came up with programs and activities for children for teens for youth we have program we partner with churches we partner with schools we partner with tertiary institutions we partner with civic organs and we we continue to develop programs to touch people in a way where they can be mentally and emotionally well. Mm -hmm. So we have a bedtime stories program for children that foster um, reading and comprehension. Um, we have uh, career counseling. We have financial literacy. That's we good. have exercise and wellness classes, cardio blasts, and we have uh, webinars, ongoing webinars and seminars, you know, just to educate the, the, the community and to provide skills that help people to transition, to, to make this new change. Because we, 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 we jump right off Dorian right into COVID. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, there was no break for us to catch ourselves when COVID happened. And so we had to, you know, help people how to cope. And so we teach coping skills. We, we provide programs for government agencies that will help them uh, who are on the frontline workers how to cope, and how to better deal with the public. Mm. So we, we do a lot of programs wow. and activities for all age groups from um small children as young as three years old straight up to our seniors um the oldest person in my program my seniors program was 103 she passed earlier this year um but you know i have a couple more 190s and even you know younger seniors but we are reaching the entire family and so helping that people to cope so now I know that um now I know because I didn't I didn't know that um uh, you know that it was it covered that broad spectrum of of life in general um preparing for entrepreneurship 
uh, going into the real world, resilience, fighting your way through struggles and challenges is not only is not is, is not just the, the the physical and the mental, but also going into the into into the secular world and uh, yes. you know yes. um, uh, be bold and be brave and to face your challenges and keep on. Mm-hmm. That is that is really excellent because as you said, as you said, um, if you have been hit with disaster one after the other and you have been you have been broken time and again or you 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 have tried and and you have lost your resources and uh, you know everything crumbled sometimes for some people it's hard to lift themselves up mm-hmm. and to find hope and and as as i said that i saw somebody here who was, uh, was zelda saying remember hope and beyond in the un in the usa also uh, that you your center is in partnership with so Hope and sure. Beyond. Yes. Hope and Beyond. Um, tell us a little bit about that. So Hope and Beyond um, uh, came about as a result of the increasing cases in suicide among teens. Mm, okay. And its founder, Janet Plummer Brown, who I met on the Zoom room, the Caribbean Zoom room, mm-hmm. um, reached out to me with this vision she had because she was touched in a personal way um, by the suicide of a friend, a friend's child mm. and, um, and someone from her, another young person from her alma mater. Mm. And because we're in mental health and wellness, in fact, Sister Janet Brown, God is so intentional because here's this lady that I met on the Zoom room. She didn't know what I do. She didn't know where I work, what I did. We met on the Zoom room. She heard me preach and whatever. And uh, and she just said, the Lord just lead me. I have this vision and the Lord just is leading me to speak to you and to ask you to come on board with us. Mm-hmm. And I was like, okay, sure. Because um, suicide is one of the things that we are concerned about, especially when, when persons would have gone through crisis after crisis after crisis. Some people just you know just had enough and um sometimes they go from being injured to damaged Mm -hmm. where mentally they just want to check out and Mm -hmm. just don't Mm -hmm. be here anymore and so i i jumped on board and i said yes i am i'll be happy to serve and uh, through this i introduced it to my organization and we partnered we decided to partner with them and we had our first um suicide prevention uh, uh, webinar um, a few months back. Um, I think it was in June. Um, there about someone can cor- correct me. And then we it was it was so well received. Um, we we got really involved from the Grand Mama Resilience Center. We had Dr. Andy Lang, who is one of our counselors. Um, Felicia McBride, who is our clinical director. Um, uh, they, they, they were on the panel. Um, uh, we had other persons from across the Caribbean and even as far as England involved on the panel and so on. And um, we, we got together with Janet Plummer Brown and Sir Zelda Archibald and the rest of the team. Um, we had Dr. Thomas, um, Donovan Thomas out of Jamaica. Um, he was also on the panel and we, we, we had Dr. Zena Woolridge um, out of Bermuda. So it was just an international platform. And these are all mental health specialists, mm-hmm. uh, are clinically trained persons. And they were able to share such wealth of information that there was a demand for a part two. And mm-hmm. so we decided on World Mental Health um, uh, Day um, earlier this month to have another um, a part two of suicide prevention. And again, that was well received. So that, that's an ongoing partnership with Hope and Beyond. Mm-hmm. And you can find Hope and Beyond on Facebook. And um, our, our goal, our aim is to really shed light and, 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 and just speak to suicide and suicide prevention, providing parents and family members as well as survivors um, of how to cope, providing them with coping skills. Do you find, um, do you find, uh, and I don't know what, what, what things are in, um, in, in the Bahamas, what, what, what is the, what is the, 
the COVID status in the Bahamas and how has it impacted ministry other than you know the the lockdown earlier how is it how is it always the new trades or the new um strain going going on now in the bahamas what things are like in the bahamas the the truth is um like everywhere else we have been impacted by covid um there there have been a number of deaths i don't have the recent statistics mm -hmm. but a number of deaths i've known of uh, quite a few persons who have passed, um, persons close enough to me um, in terms of church sister, uh, you know, persons from our church and our church circle. Um, I've known of persons who have passed from the, the this vicious virus, and um, our health system is overwhelmed, to say mm -hmm. the least. Mm -hmm. As you know, the Bahamas is a, a relatively small small nation of just over 300 plus thousand persons mm. and um, we just uh, basically two or three three um, major hospitals serving serving the entire country in addition to other clinics on the smaller family islands and so on so our system you know is overwhelmed but I believe we have been doing very, very well in keeping the COVID at bay to a certain degree, considering um, very early, very early um, out the gate, the, as I said, the Prime Minister locked the country down. And um, I, I don't want to get into it because it, it became political and, you know, different sides arguing whether he should or shouldn't. The fact of the matter is the precautions were put in place. We started wearing masks very, very early. We continue to wear our masks. The message of sanitizing um, has been far and widely spread. Um, our schools have been trying their very best to monitor the situation. We, our schools have been virtual and then hybrid. And, then, and as the trends change, then, you know, We've been shifting our sail according to the wind, so to speak. Right, right. And so um, that's what has been going on. As much effort as can be has been put in place to curtail the spread of this virus in the Bahamas. Mm -hmm. Do you find do you find in your in your um, in your experience um, uh, other than the availability of service, do you find that there are a number of people who who have uh, so to speak, hit rock bottom in their minds that they that they feel like they, they're overwhelmed, that life is, they don't see any light at the end of the tunnel. You know, um, uh, in, in other I words, they, they, they don't they don't see hope. And I know the hope, I hope against, I hope beyond hope. Because as I said, hope is the last thing you want to lose. Because when you lose hope, then there is nothing to keep going for because nothing makes sense do you find people are, are regularly who have get to the point of hopelessness uh, to the point that they say you know life is not worth living because i've exhausted everything do you find that frequently or not really frequently it is sad to say that um since this year we've had about if my memory serves me right about four or five suicides i'm sorry to hear that and one of those was a teen, I know for sure. Two police officers. Really? Wow. And so, so to answer your question, yes. When I came to the Bahamas nearly 30 years ago, I, I was shocked and pleasantly surprised that I didn't see any mad people on the streets. You know, having gone to school in Kingston, right before. you know how every corner you see a madman and a mad woman and when i came here i didn't see crazy people on the streets i was like wow and then if there was one person who was mentally ill mm -hmm. then everybody knew that one mentally ill person mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and actually looked out for that one mentally ill person mm -hmm. and over the past I, I, I would say since Hurricane Matthew in 2016, we have seen as a community more and more mentally ill persons mm -hmm. walking the streets. 
So you uh, you attribute that to having depressed. lost everything, don't know where to go, stressed and depressed, and uh, hitting rock bottom, nowhere to turn. Um, you know, so the psychological and uh, psychological uh, effect of all that's happening, driving people beyond where they can, their capacity to to retain their sanity. Yes, and that is why the Grand Bahama Resilience Center is a need. We are filling a gap. Yes, the public health services provide um, services for mental health, but because of the stigma, people Again. do not want to access that. Mm -hmm. And then there's the issue of uh, uh, trust and confidence in the system, mm -hmm. and, uh, mm -hmm. you know. And so that's one of the reasons why the center was open, to provide mm -hmm. people with a space that was comfortable, relaxing, and provided other programs and services. So someone is coming in the center for counseling, but you don't know that they're coming there for counseling. Right, right. Because they could be coming there for a class. Right, okay, okay, okay. Or an activity or an, a program. They could be coming for an art class. That's a good so thing. That's a good thing. walk through the door, no one knows that what no you're going to which no one knows which department you are going to because there are many different roads, many different branches. When you come through the gate, there are many different branches go. That is that is that is a good that is very good because it 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 helps to eliminate the one dimensional uh, mindset that if I walk through here, it's like it's like if you if you walk into a whorehouse, you can't tell him you're going there to have a prayer meeting. You know, they, they, won't, they won't think that's why. But so so when you have all those activities happening in the same place, that helps to eliminate reasons not to come. That's right. And that's what we want, for people to access the help they need. And so we have schools referring students to us for counseling. And uh, we have three professional counselors on staff, clinically trained. The, the schools uh, refer students. We have the court re referring students. Uh, sorry, referring persons we have social services referring persons to us for counseling and so we serve as a hub and a channel uh providing persons who need more specialized care then we will further refer them to the the um public health um, um facilities uh to get that specialized help you know mm -hmm. they need uh more psycho psychiatric um uh, uh, care or something like so um, yes, that's why the centers need, and more and more we're seeing more persons accessing the help. We have uh, clients who are couples, um, young people, we have you know teenagers, we have uh, older persons. People are getting more and more comfortable. So yes, something good is happening. It's not going to happen overnight where the stigma right. is just going to totally go away but we're seeing the progress over the past two years that we have been on this mission that people are becoming more and more comfortable and daily we're seeing persons coming in to collect intake forms to say i need the help that you're providing wow that is that is excellent that is excellent it's like um what i would call it now a, a multi-purpose center uh, yes. that they are multi-purpose center and that is really exciting. my friends i'm talking to jennifer um barnaby and um she has a great journey and if you haven't shared yet you can still share because although we're kind of coming to the wrapping up stage of it if you still share it will create the awareness that this program is live and your friends and her friends will be able to watch it the good thing about this program is that even after we finish tonight live the program will still be live and it can still be shared for as long as it will be on facebook and youtube and that is until god knows when all right so um so so thank you for joining me um now a uh, great program now before we come out for the program um tell tell me how uh, somebody could find access in the hybrid aspect of it or in the virtual aspect of it, how could somebody outside of the borders of the Grand Bahamas become, uh, you know, find the benefits of that? Uh, you know, what's what's the what's the door opening to find access? If somebody said, "I am I am across this island, I'm here somewhere else, and I'd like to I'd like to contact you to see uh, help me to prepare myself for something," how do they do that? 
Okay, so we can be found on Facebook, Grand Bahama Resilience Center. We are on, uh, we have a, a webpage, www.gbresiliencecenter.com. Mm -hmm. We are also on Twitter and Instagram, GB Resilience Center. And um, our local number is 242 602 five one one or two four two and that's the one before the two four two one two four two four four three seven one seven eight okay so if somebody is listening and they know somebody who is struggling with with whatever it might be they might need to be prepared to prepare themselves for going into the world uh, to find hope uh, they might be dealing with something that they're uh, mentally psychologically emotionally affected and don't know where to turn they just need to talk to somebody confidentially uh, and to find a way out they might not want to talk to family or somebody who they know because of the uh, you know the, the the fear of it not being kept within the circle here you can access uh, a resource and people somebody to talk to from the uh, the grand bahamas resilience center um and you've just gotten those numbers and their um the the website they, you can find them on facebook um the grand bahamas um, resilience center and you have them some phone numbers there that you can you can check on that so you can find access i am so thankful so this wonderful man in your life that has been such a great man uh, what is what's his name the love of my life david alexander barnaby david alexander you know the alexander thing is always a big name right and somebody you know alexander is a big name no matter where you are <laughs> Alexander is always a big name. Well, um, uh, and you have two children. Uh, four yeah, four children. Four children. Uh, four children. How old are your children? Uh, my eldest is twenty-six. Um, then I have a twenty-two-year-old. So I have a twenty-six-year-old daughter, twenty-two-year-old daughter, um, a, a seventeen-year-old son, and a twelve-year-old daughter. All right. So you, so you're in twelve to twenty-six. So you're still within nice range. Uh, good range oh my goodness you have been you have been a source of inspiration and your story is just a wonderful one is is, is anything that i didn't ask that you would like somebody listening to know uh, anything that i didn't pop up in my mind i really didn't cover that you'd like somebody to know about about the things that we haven't even touched the preaching part yet because i heard a lot about the preaching part that you <laughs> are that you are this um phenomenal preacher that but some others are saying that you know uh, hey she is just um tell me about you 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 your preaching ministry give me a little synopsis on that okay well, um, people don't praise themselves on that but you give me a little synopsis of that i i i don't know if i call myself a preacher i tell myself a messenger at right. the age of 17 i received the baptism of the holy spirit after tarrying for five years you use the tarry I, thing we, we're pretty close oh to Lord. That. i did a little bit more than that but, uh, but. <laughs> And after tarrying for five years, I was asked to preach a youth Sunday night at my church. And I told God, I am not going to preach. Because they, they, I, we, I used to do a lot of acting, uh, a lot of drama at church, and they would always give me the preacher part. And okay, so, all right. okay. you know, from that, they said, you can preach, man, you can preach. Another so, way of discovering what you have in you, right? It's okay. <laughs> so, um, of course, I said, Holy Spirit, I am not going to preach until you come and fill me up. And I was serious about that. So although they had already planned you Sunday night that I was going to be the speaker, I told Holy Spirit, if you don't come, I am not doing it. And so that Friday, I was sweetly filled with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And in my experience of tarrying, Bishop, I heard the Holy Spirit said to me, you have not chosen me, mm. but I have chosen you. Preach the word Preach three the times. Word. Bishop, can I tell you that I didn't even know that that was a, 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 a scripture in the Bible? 
Really? <laughs> until 12 years after that experience. Wow. When I was sharing my testimony, a pastor's wife said to me, do you know that that's a Bible verse? John 15, 16. Mm. Wow. And I said, okay, God. And I preached my very first message at 8, 17 on that youth Sunday night from 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 19 to 20. And my topic was, we are not for sale. We are not not for sale. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Okay, okay. We're and not for sale. All right. You are All not right. for sale. You're I not for sale. Me. You're and not so for sale. I have, I have been preaching ever since then from time to time, here and there, here and there, here and there. And God um, in his providence, God in his awesomeness. I remember there was a period of time when God would just download messages, messages, messages in my spirit. My belly would burn with passion. And I said, God, this is not fair. It's not right. Where is the platform to preach these messages? But he was processing me. Processing. He was processing me. And in the fullness of time, in the fullness of time, God has created platforms for me to share the gospel besides uh, the occasional invitation in my local churches and across the district he has provided mm -hmm. um, other platforms for me to share the word of god and so i i just thank god for that opportunity god bless your heart and god bless your ministry and god bless your future and god bless your plans ah uh, yeah i know i know zelda is, zelda is your biggest cheer lady here you know I, I don't know what zelda is but she's your biggest cheer lady here she she's really she's really selling you a uh, big time you know <laughs> i met sister zelda on the on the caribbean zoom room actually okay okay, okay. Um, and um she she just adopted me she became my big sister we have never met in person Oh, you never met in person? No, on the Caribbean okay. Zoom room is where we have met, and it's like we know each other. She prays me on. I, I minister every Thursday morning on the Afterglow. Oh, you're, so on, oh you're on the Afterglow. Okay, okay, you every Thursday. Okay, I have been I have been pretty busy. I've been on the uh, on the round table, uh, and you know I I joined in on the round table a number of times. I slipped yeah. into the Afterglow a couple of times, so I may have seen you one of the uh one of the thursday mornings but Perhaps. Perhaps. I, I, never, I never i never stayed on the afterglow because you know I, I, movements happening but but okay so the zoom room is a powerful thing for sure that um okay. that, that ministry is a, is, a, is, a, is an incredible ministry um that the, the new testament caribbean is doing if you never joined that then you can check out the new testament caribbean and on, on, on facebook and you can actually tap into their prayer meetings i think at six o'clock in the mornings and yes. and the round table at noon mm -hmm. uh, that's where my heart is because I'm, I'm fully awake by that time because i go to bed too late at night to catch up on this on the prayer meeting part of it but that is just uh, doc, doc, dr dr um joyce Barnett? Barnett is just Barnett, yes. an incredible incredible, awesome. incredible lady uh, so yes, um, you know. So one of these Thursday mornings, I might be, I'll slip into the Zoom to the um, to the afterglow, and 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 tap into your glowing. Okay, thank you. That would be great. I actually had my debut on the roundtable as a presenter yesterday. I, I served oh. as a panelist, uh, but yesterday was my debut as a oh, presenter. You, oh, you the, did. That's on interesting. The that's interesting. I was in Florida for my my father in law's funeral, so I we were just kind of um, preparing to come back to New York, so I I couldn't tap in. And um, for the past couple of weeks, it's just trying to deal with um, that aspect of our lives. But yeah. thanks be to God, I, I am so um, I'm so yeah. delighted to have this time with you. And um, is there anything you want to say to anybody before as your last words before we go? I I just want to say, Bishop. You know, having, having, you know, given my heart to Jesus at such a young age and um, stayed with him and have watched him catapulting me from abject poverty mm -hmm. to a life that people look on today and say, I would like to be like you. Mm -hmm. I would like to have what you have. 
And I can say to persons, it had nothing to do with me. Everything I am, everything I've got, everything, my entire being and existence mm -hmm. is all the favor and the mercies and the blessings of God. And I want to say to young people, especially, because as a young girl, it was not easy for me. I had needs as a young girl that my parents couldn't meet. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And had opportunities where I could have just sold myself short to meet those needs temporarily. But I stayed with God. Mm -hmm. I preserved myself. I preserved my body for the man that God had prepared for me. I served God to the best of my ability. I wasn't perfect. There were times when I just want to say, God, just let me be. Mm -hmm. But all stubborn love that would not let me go. Mm. And he has kept me over 40 years. Good for you. Over 40 years. So I want to say to someone, God is a keeper. He is God a is a keeper and he is faithful who promised. He is faithful and he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. My desire is to leave a spiritual legacy for my children and the generations to come. I want to be remembered as the woman who loved God and served God and loved people and served people and touched lives. Mm -hmm. That's the legacy I want to leave. And so, just want to encourage somebody, stay with God. Stay with God, you'll never regret it. You the will, you I will never regret it. Oh, wow. I know the story, this, the story never ends, right? The story never ends. And um, there's a continuation of the story. I want to, I want to personally, Thank you for, for, for joining me and thank you for your openness and thank you for sharing. I, I, am, I guarantee you there are some people who, who have known you and who have watched you on the Zoom room and who have listened to you present the word and have in discussion, whatever it, has, it, it may be, who have never known the, in, the inside of your story and, and some of the things that, that we talk about tonight, some people never knew about it. And now they have a, a broader view of why your passion is where it is, why you are who you are, why your ministry is what it is, and um, and and I just want you to remember as you as you go forward that when we put ourselves in the hand of God and allow Him to lead us, even when it makes no sense to us, even when we can't put it together, when those around us with the finite minds can't fully comprehend what God is doing because the natural man can't understand what God is doing because they're, they're spiritually discerned. And, uh, and as I said, um, all these little mysterious pieces and this mysterious aspect of your journey, one of these days, God will put them together when you're able to look back and all the pieces of the puzzle, you'll be able to see them and see where they fit. And then it will make, it will make absolute sense to you. And then you say, God, you really have a sense of humor. Uh, you really have a sense of humor. If you had told me this before you did it, I would have, I would have declined. But God, now I look back and say, you are indeed an amazing, amazing God. Thank you for joining me, Minister Jennifer, so Minister Jennifer Barnett, Mr. Je Minister Jennifer Barnaby, Barnaby, and please say hi to Mr. Bahamian Jamaican Barnaby husband you have there, and, uh, and and give a shout out to your children and best wishes to you and your staff, and I hope that you will continue to impact lives, and uh, and I hope that people who you've never thought of will will tap into the resources that you have available and help themselves out of where they may be that is not where they comfortably want to be. Thank you so much, sir. God bless you. God bless you, my friends. Thank you for joining me. If you, if you didn't share yet, you can still share. If you're watching and you're on Facebook, you can still hit your share button. If you're on Zoom, you can still share. And if you have not followed me on when i say zoom if you're on youtube you can still share and if you haven't followed me on youtube it's a good time to do so and 
uh, subscribe to my YouTube channel and follow me on Facebook because you never know your next best friend might be on my program sometime and you want to know if they're on so follow me and subscribe to my channel because you never know who's next gonna be in the conversation until next time my friends I want to wish you all the best and I'm gonna ask sister Jenny sister Jennifer to stay right there until I and until I till I log out so I can say offline thank you but my friends may God bless you stay encouraged stay inspired I hope that you heard something tonight that would be an inspiration to you I hope that if you have a situation that you are struggling with that you'll tap into the resources available and if you know somebody that is struggling that you may not be able to help yourself help them to find the resource from a confidential source that they can be open and honest and somebody be able to give them as much support and help as they can so that they can keep their hope alive this ministry let's talk with the dog has brought us some of the best resources that are available and the testimony of people who have struggled and come through and what the lord has done in their lives to remind others that what god has done for others he can do it for you because he's the same as he was is and will always be so may god bless you and may god strengthen your heart and may you find hope no matter what you're going through because it's not over until god says it's over all right until next time i see you on let's talk with the doc i got a great lineup i'm tapping into the church of god uh ministries and ministers boy i got a great lineup coming and by the way next week next week wednesday i'll be talking to a, a, a bunch of young people i'm gonna have a, a huge panel discussing mm -hmm. the church now the church future and how it will affect young people i'm gonna have a young pastor on i'm gonna have some young youth leaders etc i'm gonna tap into their minds and their brains and see what they see the church as what they think the church will be and how it will affect them so make sure that you put your your um your your alarm on to join me next week wednesday at eight o'clock because that's going to be a big big discussion until then god bless you have yourselves a great night hang in there sister barnaby i'll come right back and talk to you well thank you for checking in on orb ministries i trust that you will share with your friends subscribe hit the bell for notification and stay tuned because you never know what's next or who will join the conversation